And I think it's important to stress this because especially in, in more technocratic political circles, and Brussels is full of them, people sometimes give the impression that the narrative is, is like the wrapping paper around the real thing. But that's that's a big mistake. The narrative is the real thing, or at least a big part of it. And what Europe, uh, therefore, has to do is to develop also its own narrative, its own compass, as it were, to guide its action on the global stage. In 1920, the great poet Paul Valéry inked this elegant definition of Europe. Any people, in any land that has been successively Romanized, Christianized, and as regards to the mind disciplined by the Greeks, that land and that people is absolutely European. A century later, this question on Europe's identity remains as pressing as ever. Do Europeans simply happen to be the inhabitants of a minor peninsula of the Eurasian continent, or are they the stewards of a unique European culture that defines them? With Europe more diverse and less Christian than ever before, does Valéry's definition and its accent on Europe's Christian roots still stand? And what role does the European Union play in the building of this European identity? These are fundamental questions that we teased throughout many of the past 35 episodes of Uncommon Decency. Grappling with the complexities of this debate, we host two intellectuals who are steeped in both the theoretical and practical dimensions of this debate, French philosopher Pierre Manon and the former Dutch speechwriter for the President of the European Council, Luc van Middelaar. Before we dive in, we wanted to let you know that this week is our last episode before we take a well-deserved summer break. We will be working hard this summer to come back strong in September, but we need your help. This week, in addition to sharing and reviewing the podcast, we would be extremely grateful if you could answer a small survey on Uncommon Decency that should be in the episode description below. They are really straightforward questions about how you heard about the show, what kind of guests and topic you like. It really shouldn't take more than five minutes, and it's a fantastic way for you to help us continue to raise the standards of this podcast. Uncommon Decency needs you. Now, on to the show. We're so glad to have with us talk about this issue two important European intellectuals, Pierre Manon, you're a French political scientist and academic, director of studies at the EHESS in Paris. You're an assistant to Raymond Aron at the Collège de France, and have been a central thinker on the questions of liberalism and Europe for many years. You published For Reason of Nations, a reflection on democracy in Europe in 2006, as well as Natural Law and Human Rights back in 2018. On the other side of the line, we have Luc van Middela. Luc, you're a Dutch historian and a political philosopher, You've published some very important books on Europe and the EU, including The Passage to Europe, How a Continent Became a Union in 2013, and Alarums and Excursions, improving, Improvising Politics on the European Stage in 2019. You've also had an opportunity to see the EU from the inside as a member of Herman van Rompuy's cabinet, the president of the European Council from 2009 to 2014. Um, thank you so much for both of you for coming to the show. Um, let's get right into it. Luke, you, in your recent series of conferences at the Collège de France, you had a, uh, your last conference was on le récit, on, a, on, on the narrative, and saying that, pointing out that America, and especially China, have the capacity to build this, 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 this récit, this coherent narrative that strings together current policies with, with history. The most striking example, of course, being China's Belt and Road Initiative, which throws back to a history of trade with China and the rest of the world. You quote President Macron's speech at the Sorbonne, where he lamented the fact that countries like China or India are capable of building on such history um, to create such narratives, and not Europe. Why is it so difficult in Europe to build a narrative? And if I may say so, what would such a narrative look like for Europeans? Yeah, thank you for the invitation and, and for the uh, excellent question. Let me first stress the importance of narrative 
for any uh, political uh, order for any state, be it democratic or uh, non-democratic. You you mentioned uh, China, you mentioned Russia, but the same is true for the United States. When the U.S. president talks to his home audience or to an international audience, he very naturally positions himself as part or as almost as a mouthpiece of a very long history, huh? which all Americans are very familiar with and, and the rest of the world as well. And the same indeed, as you said, is, is true for the Chinese president Xi Jinping, etc. Now, in this idea of a narrative, in a way, you could almost say it's the rocket fuel that powers all forms of political agency. Huh? Without a story, without a narrative, you don't know where you're going, where you're coming from. Uh, you don't have criteria to, to judge uh, action, to decide what to do. And I think it's important to stress this because especially in, in more technocratic political circles, and Brussels is full of them, uh, people sometimes um, give the impression that the narrative is, is like the wrapping paper uh, around the real thing. But that's, that's a big mistake. The narrative is the real thing, or at least a big part of it. And what Europe, uh, therefore, has to do uh, is to develop also its own narrative, its own compass, as it were, to guide its action uh, on the global stage in particular. And coming now to your question, why this is so difficult for the European Union and also uh, be it leaders in Brussels or be it um, French presidents, German chancellors speaking also on behalf of Europe. I think that is because Europe in its own self-image has cut itself from history. It is telling a story that Europe was born in 1950 at the very uh, earliest uh, attempts and precursors of what is today the European Union. So there is a very deep urge to forget the past, which is rather understandable, of course, uh, after two world wars, uh, but which also makes it very difficult to project oneself into the future if there is no sense of a longer shared past. And just, just to conclude, if you, if you compare with uh, the Chinese narrative, huh? in, in the, the Chinese view of history, there's also a rupture, a césure, a, a historical break of the Chinese uh, revolution in 1949, or, or in Russia as well. But what you see with leaders like Xi Jinping and with Putin is that at the same time, they embody the modernity of their country, and they also harking back to a longer past, in the case of China, strikingly, including to the values of Confucianism, which were forbidden in the Mao years. And um, so you see an attempt to overcome uh, these ruptures and to mobilize this China as a civilization and as a history. And this is, and we'll get into all the difficulties, but this is also, in essence, what European Union uh, leaders also should attempt to do. Hmm. Um, Professor Manon, what do you make of this analysis? Uh, yes, I, I perfect. first, thank you for your invitation. Second, uh, I apologize for my, my English. Uh, yes, I perfectly agree with uh, what uh, Luc has just said about the importance of the narrative and the fact that Europe is lacking a narrative. Why is it lacking a narrative? Uh, I would say, first, because only nations have a true narrative. Only nations are adventures. Europe is a civilization made of many nations. And of course, there is a story, a history of Europe, which is the history of the uh, interrelations between, among the nations. So 
there is a difficulty uh, uh, there because civilization have not a narrative just as nations, like nations, have a narrative. So there is this difficulty. And the second difficulty is what Luke just said, that is, the story of Europe is a story of ruptures. ruptures. And the big rupture is between uh, the Christian monarchical history and modern democratic history. It is a big rupture. So uh, people within nations and within Europe have, um, want to say that uh, the Enlightenment is of Kleung, Lumière is a beginning of a meaningful Europe. And so they are just cutting Europe from most of its past. And we don't know what to do with the Christian past and also what remains of the Christian past in Europe. So, what can we do? I would say that if we want to have a narrative, we should not suppress the national narratives because what is meaningful as a narrative are the national narratives. Second, if we want to have a European narrative which has some relation to real history, we cannot suppress Christianity. We cannot suppress Christianity. And the uh, European institutions are doing just that systematically. So uh, th this is the, if we want to uh, be able to begin to, 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 to write or to, <laughs> to tell a European narrative, we have first to understand Europe not as a, uh, um, a beginning, a beginning in the uh, 15th, uh, 50s of the 20th century. You know, uh, Europe is a concert of nations which is going on in a different form, but it is a concert of nations. And so the narrative is a narrative of nations and of their relations. And second, Europe is the story of Christian nations which at some point uh, decided not to uh, the, to to, um, uh, to 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 limit the 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 the, 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 the place of religion to uh, to suppress uh, the uh, I would say the commanding power of the church, but nevertheless, um, uh, uh, Europe is made of uh, the, in, in the history of Europe, the, its relation to Christianity is a building part of this history. So we have to, to, to make way first for this concert of nations and second for Christianity. And in this sense, uh, uh, I am not keen to, to, to speak of uh, Christian roots because roots are in the past and it, uh, just in the past. And uh, it, it's, uh, the, 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 the problem is how to make room for the relation to Christianity today. That's because we, we, and we just stop with that, we cannot make room for Islam if we cannot make room for Christianity. And, and precisely just, just building up on, on this point and uh, the, the argument you made to, towards the start that uh, the European institutions, the supranational institutions seem, uh, seem, seem to be... Um, uh, to be for forgetful of this Christian past and the continent. Um, you know, we think back of uh, the, the, the debate in the, the early uh, 2000s around the preamble to the Constitution of Europe. Uh, and, and it seemed like a choice was made uh, then and there that uh, Europe's Christian past, Europe's Christian roots, but even, as you just said, uh, its Christian present, uh, didn't have a place in this sort of constitutional preamble that was that was in the works at the time. Um, you know, I, I wonder, um, could you could you perhaps delve a little deeper into what role you think Christianity should play in the present? What um, what kind of, of a role European leaders should should play in in elevating uh, uh, Europe's Christian roots? What what does that look like at a time when obviously society is growing more secular, when there's more uh, interfaith diversity? Uh, what does that look like in in detail? We'll start with uh, Professor Manon and then turn back to to Luke. Well. Uh... Uh, 
the way we 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 speak of Islam of the question of the religion uh, in general uh, is I think uh, not uh, the right way uh, because of the idea of separation between church and state we uh, have we have come to think that uh, the religious composition if I can use the term of our populations uh, has no importance at all. That is, uh, whether uh, people are Muslims, Christian, agnostics, has no importance whatsoever in public life. And I think everybody knows that it's, it's not the case. Of course, of course, our institutions are built on the separation of church and state. So the neutrality of public institutions is part and parcel of our uh, common life. And nobody uh, objects against that. And I have no objection against that. Of course, it's a precious part of what the French uh, call laïcité or separation of church and state. But, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that the the religious ways of life, the religious contents of life, the religious traditions, uh, whether Christian, Catholic, uh, uh, Protestant, uh, Lutheran, uh, Calvinist, uh, Jewish, uh, is, uh, Muslim, uh, are uh, part, part of our common life. So we should be able to, to take into account this this. Uh, constituent facts of our common life. And so when people say, you know, Europe is not a, a Christian club, what does that mean? As I argued in the, the, the little book you alluded to, what do, what do they say that so much? Because they know that Europe is, is a Christian club. At least at the beginning, it was built as a club of Christian nations. So it's wrong to begin with uh, making a dogma of what is clearly the truth. Uh, I mean, of making a dogma what is clearly an untruth. It be, you can say that it should, it should not be too much of a Christian nation, but you have to, to start with the fact that it was at the beginning, uh, Nation with, as I say, not Christian nation, but I say, uh, nation de marque chrétienne, a nation with a Christian mark. And now, if you accept that uh, Europe is made of nations with a Christian mark, you can argue that they have to make some room for other uh, <laughs> religions, other persons, other traditions, and that's meaningful. That's, uh, you know, that's a uh, a reasonable thing to do, it's a good thing to do, yes, but you cannot uh, uh, decide, you know, that uh, many centuries of Christian life have nothing to do with what is Europe today. So, and you, you, you um, uh, Luke uh, uh, spoke of, of Turkey in his beautiful lecture. You know, uh, why, why? the European institutions were so keen to have Turkey into Europe. Well, I, don't, I am not thinking of uh, Mr. Erdogan's Turkey, but even before him, the supposedly uh, uh, secular Turkey, which is, it never was secular Turkey, you know. But uh, uh, why people were so keen to have Turkey into Europe? Because it was to prove that Europe was not was not a Christian Turkey, uh, a, Christian, uh, a, a Christian club. So uh, that's a bit perverse, you know. That's a bit perverse because le, le, let us argue, uh, if we are sincere uh, with, with, with the question, uh, it is clear that the fact was that Turkey was so... Uh, 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 was a nation so, so cohesive, uh, with uh, 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 a nearly uh, 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 homogeneous, uh, homogeneous Muslim population, with uh, with a Christian 
having uh, forced, having been forced to flee to to flee uh, to flee Turkey. You know, um, so at the time when Europe was deciding to to leave behind her uh, national pasts, she decided that to accept to let uh, uh, into Europe a, a peculiarly nationalist and homogeneous nation with no the, not the least intention to open itself to others you know so why why this this uh, unreasonable decision because because it was a way to prove that we were not a christian club and i have nothing against turkey you know but i think that it's it's what i i said a bit perverse to in some sense, to prove a dogmatic point of political philosophy. And this dogmatic point of political philosophy is to say that you can, that uh, the, uh, the, the religious affiliation of, of people has no importance whatsoever for a political body, for a civic body. And I think that it's a very dangerous uh, proposition to, mm. to make. Uh, Luke, what do you make of this question of how we should interact with this Christian legacy in a continent that is uh, less and less so uh, Christian? Well, I agree with uh, a lot of what Pierre Manon has said, even if not, if not everything. I think um, the word sincerity is very important there, which Pierre used. That is the fact that, yes, we have uh, a millennial history of Europe as a Christian continent. I mean, the very earliest uh, references in the Middle Ages, the words Christi Christianity or Christianitas in Europe were almost synonym. Huh? So we cannot wipe uh, that out. And um, just very briefly on, on, uh, on Turkey, I think there was indeed the element uh, Pierre mentioned of proving the point uh, when the accession negotiations uh, uh, reached their high mark. But that is really um, a while ago. And I think uh, nobody either in, in Brussels, uh, Berlin, Paris, or even Ankara uh, would think that uh, Turkey one day will effectively join the European Union. Uh, Turkey clearly is on a, on a different path. Um, but it is a pity that the, uh, let's say, uh, almost constitutional hypocrisy in this respect has not has not been uh, solved or or made explicit. What I find interesting, nevertheless, and this is this is my main uh, nuance to the overall uh, story, is that there is a very deep bond between uh, the European project, the EU project, and Rome, the city of Rome, but in a way with two Romes, with the Rome of the Catholic Church. Uh, um, and it is no coincidence that the founding treaties in 1957 were signed in Rome. Uh, people spoke of the treaties of Rome. There was also uh, definitely um, a in the years after the Second World War, uh, in a very deep wish to overcome nationalism, this clinging to uh, Catholicism in particular, even if not for all EU states as um, a way to escape from nationalism huh? and to, to find a refuge with the uh, universal message of the church. But that's very clear. But also, obviously, there is the Rome of, uh, of ancient Rome, of antiquity, of Greek or Roman civilization. And to that, too, um, the European Union uh, harkens back sometimes uh, in its more, uh, let's say, history uh, interested uh, moments. And one reason uh, Greece early on became a member of the club was, was that um, it was felt that as the world's first democracy, or at least that's how it's seen in, in Europe, Greece should be a member. Huh? So there is, there, is, there is Rome of Christianity, there's Rome of antiquity, there's there's, there's Rome of, of, of the founding treaties. And when in my plea for uh, opening up a wider historical civilizational 
uh, thinking uh, to infuse, as it were, uh, Europe's self-image, there is both these realms eh, of both Christianity and antiquity which should find a place. And I was, I was thinking about one thing um, uh, on Greece. It reminds me of what Valéry Giscard d'Estaing said when he, Greece was trying to re, uh, join the European community back in the day. It said, you don't let, you don't let Plato play in second division. Um, I think that was pretty pretty telling the way the Europeans approached uh, Greek Greece. Exactly. Well, and it, it um, seems, uh, going into uh, the next question, it seems that one of the main reasons why there's been this uh, deliberate uh, uh, attempt to, to uh, bury the, the, the both the national and the Christian past of, of Europe as, as we've gone about um, integrating the continent in, in a supranational uh, project um, it seems that a main reason is, has been uh, the universal pursuit uh, to um, to import to impart values uh, that Europe sees as having a universal applicability, right? And, and uh, Professor Manon, you you wrote extensively about this in, in Cours Fabinier de Philosophie Politique. You write that Europe represents something very specific and very precious, nothing less than the universal the universal philosophy of Christian religion, of science, of democracy. And I wonder. You know what? What uh, exactly? If you could un unpack uh, this a little bit for us, what what do you mean by the universal, and um, what what is what is the role of uh, of uh, universality in, in an age where Europe's uh, role is is diminishing on the global stage? It's having to compete with uh, other rising powers, and in, 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 uh, as part of the the rising uh, Sino-American rivalry, what is what is the role of that universality in the new global landscape? Starting with Professor Menon and turning back to Lee. Well, it's uh, the most difficult question. Uh, philosophy, philosophy was born in Greece, as everybody knows. But philosophy is not any general thinking about wisdom, the gods, men. Uh, Philosophy is the search for a universal criterion, a universal criteria. And uh, for the original Greek philosophy, the criterion is nature, the nature of things and the nature of man. So you can say that before the Greek discovery of nature, the Greek philosophy, discovery of nature, uh, all other people lived within their culture, within their way of life, within the way of life of their forefathers. And the Greeks were the, the ones who said the good is not necessarily what the, the, what the fathers had decided. The good is not necessarily the good is different from the ancient for we, what has been inherited from our forefathers. That is what the, the first apparition of the universal, if you want, the philosophical universal. And uh, if you consider religion, you see that religion was was before Christianity. Religion was. Uh, inseparable from a body politic. Religion in pagan uh, cities, pagan nation, was part of the polity, an aspect, a part of the polity. Even for the Jewish people, who of course was not like a pagan city, but the God, the Yahweh, was, uh, had chosen its people, it was the people of God, and God was a God of these people. And the, the Christian church is the first and <laughs> the only today uh, uh, universal uh, religious association because the grace of God, according to the Christian uh, dogma, uh, chooses uh, its, the members of the church where it uh, where where it, it 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 chooses to do uh, among this this city this religion this culture and uh, all 
these uh, persons chosen from God become part of the city. So the, the, uh, the, the, the Christian church is the universal uh, uh, union of all the children of God, if you want. So it is the first uh, religious association which is not built upon a previously constituted social or political body. It has its, its roots within itself. So I stop with that. I have very uh, awkwardly uh, said a word on uh, the, uh, the philosophical universalism and the Christian universalism. So it is clear that these are specific European roots. Now, the question is, uh, in, 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 the, the, the important question, and I, I will try to be short, the important question about that, these are, uh, the Christian church is a universal association. Uh, and the, the the problem with uh, and the, after that the modern democracy was a national democracy so it was an association the problem with uh, the modern present day universalism of europe is that it's a universalism of the individuals it is the individual of the 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 universalism of the a bearer of human rights. Every human being is bearing human rights and the, so the basis of the present day universalism is the individual. And this is a very different universalism from Christian or pagan universalism which was built on either the church or the city. That is, you know, the Greek city was uh, the uh, uh, concretization of the human capacity to govern oneself, you know, but it was uh, uh, a concretization within, uh, through a political body. Uh, the, the individual as, uh, as such was not <laughs> the, what bore the universalism, if you want. So the problem of Christian Europe today is that we have discarded all the human association, the church, the cities, the nations, and uh, we want only to accept the individual on one hand and on the other hand, the whole of humanity, the whole of mankind. But we, you know, we, we cannot live long without without a political association without civic bodies you know and the problem of of modern present day european universalism it is that it it has become an enemy it has become a, a negation of human association uh, in the name of the, uh, the individual rights and that is a great obstacle to the building of civic uh, associations uh, in the frame of Europe. Sure, and and to get to get Luke uh, in on this question, um, uh, look, it, it seems like like another prong of European uh, universalism these days is the belief in a rules based liberal order that Europe could shape uh, in a technocratic sort of fashion through trade, diplomacy, human rights. So I wonder whether you think this combination of, indi of universe, uh, universal individualism that Germano has just outlined and the technocratic universalism uh, lives up to the heritage of Europe. Go ahead, Luke. No, thank you. I, th I think these are definitely linked. And I, I would just to, to comment briefly on Pierre Manon's very stimulating uh, thoughts here on this this long history, because in a way, and that is, of course, the big historical irony, the universalism of human rights and individualism is in a way has grown out of Christianity. That's also no historic coincidence that this uh, has found its origins in uh, Western Europe and in uh, the United States. And in a way, 
it is based on the Christian idea of the equality of all souls before uh, God. And of course, this has been uh, secularized, but there is this deep individualism within, within uh, Christianity. Now, Pierre may, may smile here and, and think uh, this is a more uh, Protestant than Catholic view of uh, Christianity in the sense uh, that it cuts out uh, some of the intermediate associations, but, uh, but I think both uh, are there. And this also is directly relevant for uh, your question, uh, Jorge, in the ex to the extent that this idea of the university, universality sorry, of uh, individual rights is also uh, linked in a different way to the idea of, of a a truth and a scientific uh, truth, which in a way you could say is more embodied uh, by uh, technocracy, but, but both are grounded on the idea of a uh, right and universal answer. Now, the, the very difficult issue now is how, um, how can Europe at the same time, remain true to itself, its, I would say, its post-Christian self, and position itself as one among many, as one culture or civilization, we can debate the terms, among uh, many in the world, as one power, perhaps, in the future, or one pole among, in a, in a multipolar world. Because Europe this idea of itself is so bound up with this universality and human rights. In a way, you see this uh, in the United States and, 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 and France as well with its uh, universal message uh, that it is very uh, difficult for Europeans to, um, to find a position, well, let's say vis-a-vis -vis human rights abuses in China, to take a very um, uh, current example, um, without feeling that they are denying, as it were, their own um, their own identity, or or, and I think this question has not changed philosophically, but this question is changing politically or geopolitically, because those nations, those states and powers who do not share this idea of universality have become more powerful. And that, that changes the political equation, even if philosophically uh, we can still have uh, this debate as we could have it 30 years ago. But politically, it's a different ballgame now. Speaking of politics, Luke, I, I want to um, um, go a little bit into the mind of pro-European figures and pro-European parties who are supposedly the true believers in this form of European identity, but also seem to be the ones who are most um, uncomfortable with the mobilization of cultural and historic symbols because they fear they could be exclusionary. Same thing for, for the kind of a geography for Europe. There's a bit kind of a reluctance to, to determine um, a geography. And um, um, in effect, it's the kind of European identity which seems to be much more focused on, on democratic values, which we all share, in, or mostly share in Europe. But these, this emphasis on democratic values also means we could include South Korea, Argentina, or India. So in effect, is this form of European identity promoted by pro-European politicians, intellectuals, actually closer to a form of advanced global citizenship, some kind of uh, future world government, rather than being connected to Europe's history, culture, and geography? Yes, I think so. I think so. Thank you, Francois. I think uh, the difficulty uh, Europeans have and European political leaders or, or thinkers is how to position themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis the universal. Because uh, European, Europeans can, can list, enumerate their values. So it's done in the EU treaty, Article 2, so rather upfront. Huh? And there you will find all the ones you just mentioned, uh, democracy, uh, rule of law, human rights, etc. And 
these um, these are all universal. So uh, I've tried also with uh, those uh, in power today to, to, to press them a little bit. Uh, for instance, the, the current EU commission uh, of Ursula von der Leyen, they have one commissioner who is responsible for the European way of life. That's very interesting. Right? That's new. And there you see, uh, in a way, the, the 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 need and the interest to define something as specifically European and not just universal, but it's um, it's it's let's say it's all very very prudent uh, or ambiguous uh, when they try to make this concrete because in a way there's always this fear as you also uh, suggested of exclusion, and I think that is. Uh, that is a pity because if if you cannot, at some point, um, decide and speak on behalf of a we, which is not all inhabitants of planet Earth, but those who happen to live on uh, the western shores of the Eurasian continent, uh, then it will become difficult to um, to act and defend interests as Europeans. Vis-à-vis uh, -vis other players who have no difficulty whatsoever, as Americans, as Russians, or as Chinese, to say, "Well, okay, we no, we are Americans. We have this way of life. You're not an American. Uh, we we can still like you, but you're not part of our club." Uh, and the Europeans find this very uh, difficult. And in a way, um, and here I guess is is the. Uh, the core of the philosophical uh, debate we're having, in a way, you could also say that that Europeans have not fully and clearly digested the heritage of Christianity in this uh, modern form and shape of the universality of human rights. Um, Professor Manon, I, I just want to also propose another alternative, which is and the idea that a form of European, a, a European nation, a European sovereignty would have another risk, which is one Hans Kunani argued in a piece called What Does It Mean to Be Pro-European Today? He published in the New Statesman last February, in which he argues the project of a European sovereignty is only a thin veil for the affirmation of a white identity against another, be it China or Islam. Um, do we have a choice between a kind of uh, larger scale nationalism, which would be uh, with all the flaws of nationalism, but on a European scale, or do we have to choose with this kind of ethereal form of advanced uh, UN cosmopolitanism uh, with little ties to what constitutes Europe? Well, I could uh, try to uh, answer this question while um, uh, commenting upon what Luc has just said, I think that if we accept a European narrative with a part of Christianity in our mold, um, with the role of Greek, Greece and Rome, that is, if we take into account the universals which were really part of, of Europe, of the European narrative, we will be able to say we, uh, if I am a, a, a modern European atheist, who, who is able to think that in some sense is part of a formerly Christian uh, polity, you know, and if this way of speaking about oneself uh, makes us able to say we, it is much more easy after that to accept that other parts of the world are not like us, that the Chinese have other ways, that the, uh, the Turks have other ways of life. You know. But if we say, what is the meaning of Europe? The meaning of Europe is European values, values which are universal, which must be universal. Then, in some sense, we are... Um, uh, forced uh, to to want to uh, uh, make uh, the whole world 
uh, subservient to our values because it's all what is it's the whole content of Europe, you know. And in this sense, it's in, insufferable that uh, uh, other people are not aware of the central importance of these values. So I think that if we were a bit more proud uh, of our real history, we will be, uh, it will be much easier to uh, be part of a, a plural world, of a world where other civilizations uh, are behaving, are uh, 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 embodying other ways of life, which does not mean that we will not be able to criticize the Chinese for the the regime. I I don't want to say uh, uh, each is is king in his own culture, and and everybody will, will be good. We we still have universal criteria, but nevertheless, um, as 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 uh, the a European narrative will make us able to say we without being aggressive or uh, crusading against others. So, uh, which is part of the answer of, to, to your second question, because, you know, if we have uh, emptied Europe from religion, nations, uh, uh, Greek and Roman uh, heritage, and we have we have just values, and then we decide that Europe of values will be a, a one uh, sovereignty. What does that mean? What does that mean? It, it just it has no meaning. You you, you cannot have uh, European values don't don't uh, are sovereigns able to act. Values don't act. Only political bodies act. So. Uh, let us not uh, empty uh, our ways of life of the constituent parts, what Karl Marx called the contents of life. I like very much this expression. Because when you have emptied our societies of their contents of life, what remains? And you see that with what people are just are saying these days uh, in a dispiriting way, with whiteness, you know, you, you, I, 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 I don't feel myself as a like a, as a white person, but when people say uh, attack me or not me personally, but uh, our societies are white privileged, white societies, I never thought of, of of myself of defining myself as such. I was a French man. I was a Christian man. I was a nary an heir to. Uh, you know, Greek and Roman civilization, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know, I, being white was never part of 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 myself. But now, if on one on one hand we have just uh, 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 a common life uh, uh, devoid of any content, you have only individual rights and the color of of the skin, which 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 forces which will force all of us in uh, 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 an ugly, I would say, situation, because we, we cannot defend ourselves like uh, as white people. But at the same time, if we are attacked just as white people, what can we do? So we need, we need to become more, more alert, more aware, of our real contents of life, you know. And these contents of life are, have nothing to do with the color of the skin. So that, that would be my, my uh, increative, <laughs> awkward answer to, to your question. Uh, thank, thank you so much, um, Professor Manon. Uh, Professor Midala, if you have any um, thoughts on whiteness in Europe, um, feel free to go ahead. Um, otherwise, we can we can wrap up on this. Um, your call. No, well, I I, I shall be brief uh, on this one. It, obviously, it's a it's a vast uh, question, and um, I think that maybe let, let me just say this: if we 
and Pierre and I both agree on this. If we want to be able to say uh, we, when we speak about Europe, we Europeans, and this of course includes uh, we the Dutch, we the French, we the Germans, uh, and if we can only do so on the basis of our history, including antiquity, Christianity, and enlightenment, part of that history also is our colonial history. I think that is a fair point uh, to make, and that is a, a part of history uh, which uh, maybe we have uh, tried to uh, forget. And um, I do not mind acknowledging and asserting parts of our history of which I am not proud. Huh? Um, because that's also who we are, just as, as a person that you have things uh, which of yourself which you like, others maybe which you don't, but still that's who you are. And I think it is the same as for the other topics we discussed, uh, Europe's relationship to other parts of the world has been, um, of course, also colored, um, no pun intended here, by, by our colonial uh, relationships and, and that history. We also have to assume that, I think, if we want to find our place as Europeans in that uh, multipolar world we have been discussing. Thank you so much, uh, Luke, for this fantastic uh, conclusion. Um, it was quite a quite a journey from the notion of a récit narrative. We started in China before going progressively to Europe, to the Christian heritage uh, legacy of, of Europe, or whatever we want to call it, in a Christian, well, no Christian Europe, but it's less and less Christian. Um, how do we play with those uh, difficulties and uh, more generally if European identity is a form of advanced cosmopolitan identity or if it's a form of um, uh, truly a truly form truly a form of uh, European nations I think that's a uh, one of these questions we've been, we've been struggling to answer today and, and we're so glad to have both um, both Luke and Pierre to um, talk about these questions uh, thank you so much to the both of you and to all our listeners Um, so Jorge, Luke and Pierre are out. What did you make of this episode? So well, one, of the, one of the main takeaways, and this was uh, really a, sort of a structuring line of thought in, in Pierre, Pierre Manon's uh, comments, was the idea that Europe has, um, you know, for, for, um, for ages on end, been uh, driven by, by some idea of uh, universality. Uh, but uh, just just what kind of universality has been has been an evolving uh, variable, and uh, whilst it used to be a sort of a very religiously anchored view of of, uh, of the good, you know, this um, idea of uh, Christendom being uh, sort of an evangelizing force in, in uh, world affairs. Uh, today, the uh, the kind of uh, universalism that uh, exudes from from Brussels, particularly, is is wholly different. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a universalism built on uh, legalism, the rule of law, and a rather kind of secular and um, morally neutral uh, view of, of Europe's role in, in shaping world affairs. And I, I was, you know, I was a part of me was sort of struck to see uh, Pierre Manon, such a an eminent intellectual. When you think of, you know, intellectuals on the right and, and French academe over the past few decades, I, I just I wasn't really expecting Pierre Manon to go so to be so outspoken in uh, verbalizing what it is that he argues we should get back to, namely the Christian roots of Europe. And, and I sometimes have you know, issues with this idea of Europe being a Christian uh, continent. Uh, I think it's, it's sometimes, that, that sometimes is a sort of a simplistic picture that overlooks. I mean, you know, the left kind of has a point, I think, when they uh, blame that sort of narrative for being ethnocentric. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced uh, that Europe is uniquely built on uh, the religious dogmas of sort of Roman Catholicism, uh, not even of Christianity at large. Uh, I think there's certainly there's been you know a great sort of mi you know mix of uh, religions and different different sort of influences. Uh, although Christianity always being the sort of the dominating uh, component. Uh, but I was really struck to see Pierre Manon, uh, you know, so so um, out, outspokenly defend this sort of traditionalist view of, of uh, European identity. And, and I think that, you know, the beautiful thing about this episode is here was a French intellectual um, in conversation with a Eurocrat. 
uh, although a, you know, and an sort of an, an academically credentialed bureaucrat, a bureaucrat nonetheless, whose entire uh, career has been devoted to the sort of the, um, the technocratic aspects of governance in Brussels. And these, these are precisely not, you know, not the kind of sort of highbrow topics of, uh, you know, civilization identity. And yet you, you did see, you know, very, uh, you know, a very well nurtured uh, discussion between the two. And I think, I think this, this was just such a great way to end uh, the second season. And uh, I really hope that people will enjoy this conversation. Yeah. Um, well, Luke was a Eurocrat for sure, because he worked at the, for the European Commission for five years. But what's interesting about his profile is that he has both a foot in the kind of technocratic world of, of EU politics and a foot in the intellectual world. Um, he actually, I think, uh, encountered Pierre Manon in the 90s in, in France when he was studying there. And so... Uh, he definitely has a foot in, in both, which makes his perspective so interesting. Um, on the on the question of his latest conferences at the Collège de France, I think this episode was really timely because in his co- series of conferences at the Collège de France, which we highly recommend uh, all, all of you French speakers go to listen to because they are just fascinating on all these topics we've, we, we've covered. Um, the idea that the Europe unlike America, unlike China, even unlike maybe India, does not have this kind of coherent narrative of itself, which allows them to kind of make sense of their current actions with a history, with a, a form of tradition. And for reason, for reason, well, not the only reason, but one of the reasons uh, Luke accepted is because he really wanted to build on this idea of the absence of a, of a European narrative. Um, and again, I think something we kind of, poked out a lot this year so one of the issue with you know so-called europeans you know the people who say you know, i'm pro-european and, and, and all rest is that they seem to defend an identity which is less actually european and more some kind of vanguard for a universal c- citizenship um there's nothing wrong against it but there's nothing distinctly european and when you see it when you kind of force you know the gear and, and all of the other people um of that kind um, if you kind of force them to kind of define what Europe is, the kind of wishy-washy answer will be, you know, no, well, Europe is about uh, democracy, openness, and, and 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 human rights, and which is also a definition which could include uh, Argentina, South Africa, uh, South Korea, but anyways, um, um, because again, you know, these things are important in part of European identity. There is no Europe without without these values for sure, but it's not in any way sufficient. And because there is this kind of malaise towards defining Europe, because that would be exclusionary, and you know how how would it would deal with the idea that if there is an us, there is a them. Um, uh, but fundamentally, the, these Europeans are not so much building a, an identity which is properly European, but is um, a, some kind of again a va- vanguard of a universal citizenship. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it's yeah, and and uh, you know, I, I really just picking you up on 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 that last point. I think. Uh, you very um, compellingly drew out the sort of um, this 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 idea that European uh, the, the sort of the normative driver of uh, Europe's influence in the world is um, it's not substantive it's rather neutral you know it, it uh, proclaims openness and it proclaims tolerance without necessarily foregrounding its own version of of, um, of the good life, the good society, the good world order. Um, and, um, and yeah, and as you said, um, it kind of le- leaves a vacuum at, you know, it, and it, it, open, it opens up the question sort of, you know, what uh, really is Europe's contribution to the world that Europe seeks to build other than building a world where all contributions uh, are welcome and, uh, and accepted and sort of equally valued, right? Um, but yeah, absolutely. Well, which makes me think that this is a great place to talk about what we've been trying to build this year. I think this question of who we are as Europeans is important. We've wanted to talk about Europe, and we were when we started thinking about this um, a year and a half ago, about uh, roughly right now. Um, we kind of looked at what existed from podcasts which talked about European affairs. 
a lot of them were very journalistic. Um, some of them very good, you know, the Politico is doing fantastic work. Um, uh, there's some, some great me- media journalistic podcasts, but none of them kind of fundamentally talked about what we thought were some of the kind of big issues defining Europe. Um, and so we had some important conversations on geopolitics, some important more meta conversations on you know, meritocracy with David Goodhart, on um, conservatism with Ed West. Um, we've had these kind of um, conversations which mattered so much to Europe, but the only people doing these were either, either very journalistic or on the flip side were, you know, uh, kind of caricatures of uh, pro-European podcasts with, you know, uh, kind of wishy-washy liberals we talked about, um, which you know, didn't really have something distinctively European about the understanding of what European identity should be. And so we wanted to talk about Europe in this kind of, in this kind of way. And it's been a smashing success. We just want to thank you so much from, for all of you, from our followers in 96 countries, if I am to believe the stats I have in front of me. Um, we have pretty much every country you can think of, from um, Senegal to Tunisia, uh, to Bulgaria, Fili- Philippines. Um, uh, most of you come from, from Europe, but a lot of you come from all across the world. And we really want to thank you for, for your support um, over time. And speaking of support, um, Jorge, I think week after week, we've been pretty diligent about asking all of you to support the show with uh, um, reviews, with sharing with friends and all that stuff. Uh, This week, we've got a special... um, This week, we have something new to offer you. If you want to help us, we really need your feedback. And so uh, we're going to do a survey. So down below in the show notes, you should be able to find a link to a survey. We survey is plenty of very simple questions which ask you how many episodes you've listened to, how you came to the show, uh, what were your favorite episodes, um, well, ha- have you shared it with friends, all these kind of very simple questions which allow us to come back next year with a kind of better understanding of who who the people listening to the show are and uh, why, why you listen to us and uh, what we can do better for next year. So um, if you have uh, a few minutes, you can actually do this while listening to the podcast. Um, uh, take a, take, a, take a, a few minutes to answer the questions. It should be really simple. You know, it's uh, A, B, C, D, click, 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 finish, confirm. Um, should be quite straightforward. And um, yeah, it really helps us a lot and makes us in, and will really help us to come back on, in September with uh, extra energy. Thank you. Thank you all so very much for, for traveling with us on, on this journey and uh, expect more from us and uh, more, uh, you know, thoughtful and um, engaging and stimulating conversations on Europe and all of its different facets on interesting sort of thorny, wonky policy questions, but also the deeper intellectual themes of identity and civilization. And it really has been a blast and it really has been a privilege to uh, be followed followed uh, along on this journey by uh, by all the, 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 the listeners and the supporters so uh, thank you so much and uh, see you very soon after the summer I was about to say see you next week as usual but yeah see you after the summer then.